Welcome here to a wake up call with Dan Tortora special here with Brandon Trish. You know, Brand I know Brandon Tr Trish as winning more games than anybody, right? Winning more games than anybody else in your history, you know, starting the games, going into them, winning them. I told Brandon that the NCAA can't take it away from him. I gave it back to him. So you can't lose uh, anything from the NCAA records. <laughs> you have your career numbers. Bayheim has his. And I'm so happy to be uh, talking with you from overseas here. So, Brandon, it's been it's been a long time too long, man. How you doing? Doing pretty good. You know, uh, I was just telling you off uh, off record that uh, I'm dealing with like a turf toe. First time I ever had like a toe injury. So, yeah. Uh, you know, typically it's for football players, but uh, I stepped on somebody's foot and uh, just out for maybe a week or two, and then I get right back at it. So tell everybody where you are right now, because you've been touring the world. Where are you at now? Yeah, I'm actually in Dubai. Lucky me. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm in Dubai. Weather is great, you know, year round. Uh, it's an incredible place to be. Um, with COVID, the numbers are pretty low, surprisingly, because it, there's so much traffic coming in and out. You would think that the uh, COVID numbers, maybe they're hiding. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but for the most part, you know, you're able to do everything. You're able to go out, eat. Uh, go to the beaches and things like that. So um, I'm pretty much living a regular life here while playing basketball, which is incredible. So being in Dubai, I mean, so many people uh, have never seen that. Syracuse fans, I would I would venture to say the majority of Syracuse fans have no idea where to even point to that on a map. So yep. describe United, Dubai to me. Tell me about it. Yes, yeah, the United Arab Emirates. And uh, Dubai is considered Asia. But uh, I mean, for the most part, when you, when, you, when you talk about Dubai, you think of like the Middle East. So it's uh, what's surrounding it, you know, I guess the Gulf. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what what's the Gulf. <laughs> it's the Gulf of something. <laughs> but the surrounding uh, countries are like uh, Qatar, Qatar, um, Saudi Arabia. You know, that's that's um, near. Um, you have uh, Omen. You have, you know, all these like Lebanon, those places. So I'm in that in that area which is why the weather is so nice but for the most part i mean if you think if you think of dubai and it's, it's everything and probably more than what you um can think of you know with this how um how luxurious it looks um you know it's just the weather is great you can eat any kind of food that you want um there's no language barriers you know and for the most part people don't notice um there's only 15 percent of local people that live here oh, wow. like people who actually born and raised you know and live and actually from uae there's only like 15 percent. so just over 200 uh i believe over 200 nationalities that live in dubai so def it's definitely an international city yeah you know and that's and that's incredible and you hear about people talk about going over there and when you hear somebody say they've been to dubai you're thinking like this person's got to have a ton of money you know the mm -hmm. ability to travel and whatnot i mean you have had what so many syracuse players have had the opportunity to do, which is play overseas. And it cannot be understated. You know, we talk about the NBA, but traveling the world, Roosevelt Bowie Jr., uh, what you've been mm -hmm. able to do, you know, the, the the Trish family to Dale Shackelford to, you know, I mean, so many people have been at Trevor Cooney, who I just spoke with recently and what he's been able to do and uh, Johnny Flynn and the list goes on and on and on and on. Just what you could say about, it goes understated, but a lot of Syracuse players historically have made successful careers overseas and, and you being one of those people you have played for years now overseas in mm -hmm. different places and you've been able to continue basketball so just to speak on that yeah I mean it's a blessing you know at the end of the day I think for the most for most of us who love basketball you know once you get past high school um, once you get to the college you know you really start thinking about money and thinking about like how can I make money from you know a sport you know and uh, a lot of us been playing all our lives, so we, we want to play, you know, at the highest level and make money. So obviously it's NBA. And if it's not NBA, uh, the second best option to make money is overseas or just abroad in general. Um, so that's why so many people do go overseas. And, you know, I think uh, with Syracuse being such a elite program, um, playing at the highest level, D1, you know, you're going to have, you know, you know, nine out of 10 guys play professionally and you might have, you know, you're going to have two guys play, you know, in the NBA and things like that, just because there's so much competition and, um, you know, there's so much history uh, and prestige, you know, just being a Syracuse Orange. 
you know, and, and, you, and the kind of the reversal of that, which is really interesting, is <clears throat> Marek Dolajai. And when he was mm-hmm. getting recruited uh, out of Slovakia, when I had the opportunity to uh, speak with, with Adrian Autry, Adrian was on him like way early. And he said to me, he was like, listen, I'm going to go check out this guy in Slovakia. And like, nobody knows about, like nobody knew about it. And, and we were just kind of talking about it. And he went over there and Marek said, he said he, you know, coaches called him, but nobody came to see him except for Adrian. He said, Adrian came to see my dad and I, what can you say about Marek's play and what he's been to this team? And the, and the fact that Syracuse, not just on the men's side, but coach Q is willing to go all over the world as well to find these players and has really, you know, mm-hmm. have been able to really pull in these incredible guys. So it's not just you guys from Syracuse going overseas, it's Syracuse yeah. pulling from overseas as well. Yeah. I mean, I mean, as a, if you're a recruiter, you want to have that hidden gem, you know, you want to have the guy who maybe isn't recruited as much, but overperforms to his, you know, his ranking. So I think that's a lot of, a lot of us at Syracuse are like that, you know, Sometimes we, we maybe we're not, you know, everyone knows us, obviously, but we maybe not the McDonald's All-American, but we perform higher than our ranking or whatever the case may be. And that's the same thing with uh, Merrick. He's playing really well. I mean, he's, he just, you know, Doja is just, uh, he does everything, you know, so he's rebounding, he's uh, bringing the ball up the court, you know, he's playing defense still and blocking shots. So he's really the key to the team. You know, I, I watched about five to six games this year. I mean, obviously, uh, last night the game was at on at five thirty in the morning, so it was, <laughs> it was kind of tough to like even watch that. So I always catch the highlights. Um, but for the most part, when I do watch, um, overall, man, he's just the key to the team. You know, it's tough because obviously, you know, Syracuse we're we're lacking uh, big guys, and um, him being you know only like two hundred pounds, it's tough because a lot of times he he, he is in um, foul trouble. So he probably you know if if he did have more backup as far as the big guy go, then he probably, his game will probably be even stronger, you know, just because he'll be, he'll have more freedom to play more of his natural position and, and, and uh, you know, uh, dominate in that way. Speaking here with Brandon Trish, Syracuse Orange basketball alum, I said at the beginning of the show that, that you still hold the record. Uh, share with everybody mm-hmm. that may not know, to the little kids out there that may not know, and the future Buddy Bayheim, <laughs> so to speak, what that record is, and how the NCAA uh, cannot take it away. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a good and a bad, you know, because uh, for this day and age, obviously, the best players never really stay four years, you know. So you could look at it in two different ways, right? Um, obviously, uh, the record is I have the most uh, NCAA starts. Um, well, I think it's games played. I played the, the most games played, meaning that I – I probably play, uh, meaning that you have to play at least four years and also the most starts. So throughout my whole career, I never missed a game. I was never injured. But it also means that I was on good teams that always went to the tournament, to the March Madness tournament, who always did pretty well in the Big East tournament. So I was able to play, you know, 36 to 40 games each year. And in each of those games, I started, you know, um, you know, and, and that just say that uh, Bayham, he just trusted me all four years at Syracuse, you know. So I think that's more that's the most important thing than anything is that uh, I was able to have the trust of a coach. Um, and with that being said, you know, I think I did pretty well uh, with that responsibility. 2009 to 2013. Bring me into your experience of the NCAA tournament. I mean, in 2009, 2010, the team mm-hmm. made it to the Sweet 16, second round the next year, Elite Eight the next year, Big East regular season champions. And then in 2012, 2013, made it to the Final Four. So in your time yeah. at Syracuse, you had a Sweet 16, an Elite Eight, and a Final Four, and were able to claim a championship in the Big East. I would say that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I, th- I think, uh, you know, I, th- I feel like you're saying the conference champion. It was the only one. Oh, we found it. I thought we tied. You were Big East at uh, 2011, 12 Big East regular season champions. And then okay. you were the uh, regular season title in 2009, 2010. Okay. See, okay. There we go. 
I knew it was something like that. Well, sorry, I, I missed one of the 19 you know, things you guys did. So, and to, to be honest, I'm not even. I I believe each and every year I was I was at Syracuse, we we reached number one. Like I think we were ranked at least one each year, if I'm not mistaken. We might it might have not been. Uh, I, I believe it it could have been the my the freshman year, maybe not. But I knew we were at least top five each year. I was uh, at Syracuse, so that's yeah, also I mean, maybe. That's also like a little, little fun, little fun fact. I mean, it's but, um, incredible. And you look, oh, but go ahead with what you were going to say. What was it? What was your question again? I forgot. It. Just what you could say about your experience of the NCAA oh. tournament. Oh, yeah, because yeah. some guys, you know, some some men and women play their entire collegiate career and they never even go they to never, one game. There's schools exactly. that are trying to win their first conference or first uh, tournament game ever, and you got to go advance every year to the NCAA tournament. Yeah. And Sweet 16, Elite Eight, and Final Four, you got to acclaim all those. Yeah. I mean, to, to me, it's just, all I can say is I'm, I'm grateful, you know, and uh, I think because we were playing at such a high low that it was just like a mandatory thing. It was just like <laughs> when we started the season, we were thinking, like, how far are we going to go in the NCAA tournament? We never had the thought of, how are we going to make it, you know? Yeah. And uh, with that being said, you know, a lot of our focus was – was preparing for the end of the season. Um, for me personally, I always enjoyed like the first 10 games and then the Big East tournament and then the playoffs and then the March Madness. It's just because like when you, when you playing well and you know that you're probably going to make it to the tournament, you're not, you're not really worried about the middle games. It kind of becomes like, okay, let's, let's speed up to the end of the season, you know? Uh, once you start playing well, you get into the Big East tournament and uh, you see how you match up against everyone else. I mean, ultimately, if you do, if we finish first place in the Big East or we finish, we win the conference, that doesn't mean anything if you lose the first game of the tournament. Yeah. I mean, most people are just going to remember that it was a waste of a season. That's how, that's how a lot of people would think. Individually, I would know, okay, I won those games and, you know, I feel great about myself. But, most fans are going to remember the loss uh, and not, you know, how great you were playing that season. So um, it was an incredible experience for me. Like you said, uh, we uh, Sweet 16, Elite 8, um, Final Four. And to be honest, we actually made the Final Four with the least talented team that I was on, which is probably incredible. <laughs> you know, that team we actually had, you know, we were, we were playing really well. You know, we lost like four or five, four out of – I think four out of five or five out of six of our last out of our last games before um going into uh the big east tournament and in the big east tournament we got it we got a rhythm we won those we won uh we, i think we made it to the uh championship game playing against louisville and we actually lost to those guys but we reached the rhythm and we was able to carry it over to the march madness so i mean for those who are you know who aspiring to play in the ncaa tournament I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's like you're on, it's like you're an entertainer and you're on the stage, you know, it's just, I just remember like the black uh, curtains, you know, it's like you walk into the stadium, you have black curtains, you have black outline on the end of the court. Um, some courts are even raised up a little bit, you know, and it's just. Yeah. The final I mean, four great, one was off the ground. I remember. Yeah. That. The final four was, I think it was like six feet up. You know, we had to step, we had to step down and sit down, you know, you really on the stage because, Final four, you're playing in front of 75. You really, like, you, you put the court in the middle of the dome <laughs> and have fans, you know? So, and this is probably, a, I mean, it's an NFL dome, so I'm assuming it probably was bigger than the Carrier Dome. But it was like 75,000, and you, you'd be playing, and it's like everyone's looking at you. So, I mean, listen, that, that's like an experience I'll never forget, for sure. And I remember being in that dome. It was you, Louisville, Michigan, and Wichita State. Mm -hmm. And I remember that there was like the fans, there was like the court and it was raised and then there was people and like media. And then it was like a split and then it was raised and there was media. And I remember looking all the way up to the old Georgia dome. Cause now the Mercedes Benz stadium is there. But I remember looking all the way up and there was people at the top of the dome that looked like balloons that had kind of like just risen up. They looked like little tiny specks. <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, what did it look like from your point of view? Man, from from when I looked, it looked like from like from the stage, from the court until like until maybe from like all of the field until when you actually get the hit the road stand. It, was, it seemed like it was a mile of people, maybe like 
like literally slowly but surely creeping higher and higher. But it was like it had to be at least seventy rows of people, but like slowly, like slowly, like a little slow, like a a short slope. So it seemed like so many people, and and then it's like it, for and I could like literally see individual people, it was, which was crazy. It was like you could see everyone, you know, like you're on the stage, you're on the stage, and they can see you, but you can literally see everyone because they're pretty much at your eye level, yeah, you know, because you're raised up a little bit. So I mean, I thought it was awesome. Um, like that was yeah, yeah, that was awesome, man. And I can't say enough about it. Even that whole experience, you know, I was in uh, we were in Atlanta. And uh, like half of my family, half of my mom's side of my family lives in Atlanta. So I was just able to go get a haircut. I was able to go <laughs> get cryotherapy. I was able to, you know, go to my family house and everything, you know, my cousin's house and just hang out while I was down there. So, you know, I just, I just enjoyed that whole weekend. Did you know where they were sitting in the Georgia Dome? Like, could you pick them out? Yeah, well, my, well, my, my parents were like right behind me. And then, well, actually, majority of my, my family was right behind me. So they're right behind the stage, or right, right behind our bench. And then you have, like, uh, so before, so then they even had, like, the, uh, they had to practice where all the fans could come. Yeah. So the majority of my uh, family actually came to that. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you got to get tickets. So, like, I probably was only able to get, like, I think I was able to get, like, 15 tickets. So for the most part, all of them was there. And then you have like a few people who I seen that, that was like uh, probably in the middle of the court. I was like, oh, okay, I see, I see, you know? Yeah. But uh, for the most part, you know, everybody sat behind my, our bench. Brandon, we forgot to add in another statistical positive. And so I know how, you know, we talked about Big East and you were like, there's two Big East. Well, let me tell you another thing here. It's, I'm sure you know, but we left it out. In your four seasons at Syracuse, the team won at least 30 games in yeah, three yeah. of four years. In the only year they didn't win 30 games, you guys won 27 in one season. You went third and four, 34 and three. So I would venture to say that in your time at Syracuse and your career starts and games played and everything that you did, the team did pretty okay with Brandon Trish out there winning 30 games in a season to a lot mm-hmm. of NCAA programs of over 300 men's basketball D1 teams in the nation, winning 30 games is a feat some people never get to. Yeah, You man, did it three out of four all, times. Crazy. And the game, and the year that we won 20 uh, was was the year that uh, A.L., Renze Anawaku got hurt. So, uh, which was my freshman year. It was my, no, it wasn't my, it was my freshman year, right? You're talking about my freshman year, we won 27. 27 was your uh, sophomore year. Sophomore year. Okay, yeah. But even in so, the second round of the NCAA yeah, we tournament. Were, yeah, 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 I remember we, had, we lost to Marquette, which was, which was uh, I'm sorry, which was a, a tough game, you know, but uh, it was, I mean, it was incredible. Um, I think just, I'm just grateful, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the, to me, it's like, okay, I feel like I helped, but some of it is the right timing. You know, yeah. I mean, it was good timing because it was like, you know, we were struggling a little bit right before I got there and we were struggling a little bit since I left. But <laughs> <laughs> so maybe they, they need you to come there. That man, that fifth year of eligibility from Corona. I mean, does that go to you guys? Do you get grandfathered in? Yeah, man, I wish I wish, <laughs> man, which is it. that's it. What they're doing now, playing with through COVID and all that stuff, man. You know, I'm just, I'm happy I was able to have a college experience, the normal way of just having fans and everything like that. So, uh, I mean, I tell to you, be it's honest, very like, strange playing in it, seeing it like I'm sitting in the dome. Syracuse Georgetown was the weirdest one, not to, not to interrupt, but like Syracuse yeah. Georgetown in the dome this season with like, I don't know, 30 of us media and a bunch of empty seats. And you can hear like every whistle and hear coach yelling and all this stuff. That to me, like, I kind of got along with it and just was like focused on the game all year. But when Syracuse played Georgetown, because I grew up around it, like that to me was yeah. one of the weirdest things in the world to have nobody saying anything in, in the, uh, in the stands. It was weird. You know what, you know what most places should do like a, like a carrier dome. What they should do is put a curtain, like a, 
so so you cannot see the, the fans or whatever. So if they allow people on one side, you know how we get we have the blue curtain, or whatever. Yeah. But where they can't have it, if you looked at the TBT, they had curtains behind the court, curtains like you know, like on both baselines, they had a curtain, and on the sideline, like the reporters and things were on the sideline, and the bench the benches was on the other side, and there was another like curtain behind. So I feel like maybe they should do it like that you know, and make it like, I guess, a, a smaller intimate uh, setting versus, you know, you out playing, you know, you seeing the top of the building while you're shooting, you know, you know what I mean? So yeah, maybe, maybe, well, hopefully next year we don't have to, we don't have to deal with that, you know, and for, 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 I know for a lot of Syracuse, um, Syracusians, uh, it's tough, you know, because our year is made by, watching Syracuse basketball and going to the game. So that just leaves you with one less thing to do. You know, it's not, it's not like Syracuse is like incredible, you know, so much to do. So you take away basketball and being able to watch basketball in person, you know, you kind of taking away a whole, a whole, a whole year kind of, because that's a six months experience, even football, football season and all that. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how have you kind of two-parter, could you have ever seen yourself playing through a pandemic? Like, what do you think about the the men and women that are playing and coaching through this pandemic, number one? And the second part of that is, do you have any fear or concern being in another country while the world is navigating through a very interesting situation over the past year? Well, I, I, I try not to think too far ahead. Um, to me, I mean, for all of us, everything is new. So I just don't know how nervous to be. <laughs> like if I, if I knew if, you know if things were like terrible then I would know but since I'm you know kind of ignorant to the whole process I think we all are because it's the first time for for our generation that um, we're going through a situation like this so um could I play yeah you know because when I play basketball because I love it you know I don't necessarily play for the fans um and for the notoriety you know I love playing basketball so I'll I'll go play pickup. I'll go to the park. You know, I'll go. So if I could play at a park, you know, if I grew up playing without fans, then why can't I play without fans as a grown up? You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's no, I mean, once the ball is out, you know, uh, once the ball gets thrown out and you start playing, you, you, to me, you don't really think about it. You know, at least I, I, I didn't think about it. Uh, I mean, I think that was one of the questions for uh, the TBT was how would you think? Or how, how would you feel? Yeah. And uh, being in Dubai, we don't have fans as well. So it was like, it's, it's normal. It was like, may, maybe uh, to me, it might be less pressure, you know? So, yeah. Being in the TBT, everybody gives the NBA credit for creating a bubble, but the TBT did it before anybody did it. Did it before the MLS, did it before the NFL had their season, MLB. The TBT really set the precedent of bringing sports, live sports back to the world. So, what can you say about being a part of that and the fact that the TBT, which things that were done there were probably implemented elsewhere because it worked? Yeah, I think also they did the USC bubble. I believe they did it uh, maybe in Abu as I, I think it was in Abu Dhabi where they did it. But um, uh, I, thought, I thought it was incredible. Uh, it was annoying a little bit, you know, because, <laughs> I mean, just to play basketball, it's like you're, you're in like a two-week jail. You know, yeah. you're like a two week summer camp or something. <laughs> That's how I feel because like you can't leave a hotel. So for the for the time I was, so the time we were in the bubble, which was let's say July fourth, I believe, from there until when we lost, I think it was like the fourteenth or t somewhere around there. I think it was like ten to twelve days. You have a COVID. First of all, you, you take a COVID test. You take we were we take four COVID tests before we got there. We took, we took a COVID test while we got there and we couldn't leave our room. And then from there, on the second day, obviously those who passed, those who didn't um, who didn't pass got to go home. And then those who choose to practice, if one person got it, the whole team had to go home. So for us, um, we did choose to practice, but thankfully no one had, you know, caught uh, COVID. So... You know, they just did it every other day. They did the COVID tests. And I believe after like the fifth or sixth day, yeah, no, you know, the COVID was like at zero percent. So no one, so the bubble actually worked. But it was, I mean, teams were going home. You know, you had guys who passed the first six COVID tests and then on the seventh one, 
boom, they had COVID. So, um, listen, it's a tough experience. Obviously, an NBA bubble is different because the whole campus is like, it's like saying, uh, it's like being on SU camp, uh, not even. Let's say it's, like, they were in Disneyland. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a, you know, so, but it was for two months. So, you know, they just, it's just, it's tough because you don't want to feel restricted. But, you know, they were in a, a much better experience than just being in a hotel, a huge hotel. And, okay, you could order food, but you can't leave. So it's like, you know, it's all for the love of basketball. I mean, we, we you know, that's how strong basketball is um, now, you know, in sports in general. You know, sports is life, really. And some people feel like they can't live without sports. You know, and it, it's funny you said you can order food because pretty much everybody can order food except for if you uh, get those lemon pepper Lou Wills, because then you get yourself in trouble having to leave. But <laughs> so, well, you but, go order food, but he, the, he, he went off campus to go and get those. Uh, lemon, to get he wanted, lemon he wanted pepper. a special kind. He wanted, he wanted just one from one place. He wanted from one place. That's, that's what it, that's what it was. He only eat lemon pepper from one place. So he had to go. To yeah. get those. Is it, wow. is, is in that place in Atlanta? No, he went to a, he went to a strip club. Right. But where is the strip club? Yeah. I thought it was in Georgia. Yeah, in Atlanta, yes. Oh, okay. He's from Atlanta. He's okay. from Atlanta. So he, he flew back, I believe, for a funeral. And that night, he had went. And obviously, <laughs> obviously, they seen him. <laughs> Which turned into the Drake's uh, Lemon Pepper Freestyle that just came out. Uh, Brandon, before I let you go here, uh, real yeah. quick, uh, looking at your teammates, man. I mean... I know we'll spend time on another show about this more extensively, but Andy Routens, Wesley Johnson, Rick Jackson, Renze Onowaku, Chris Joseph, Scoop Jardine, mm -hmm. Deshante Riley, James Sutherland, Freshman, yeah. Sam Mello, CJ Fair, Dion Waiters, Bai Musikita. Oh, yeah. Like it, it goes on and on. Uh, Michael Carter Williams. I think I said Rakeem, but if I didn't, Rakeem, uh, you know, th these teams were just filled Trevor Cooney, Jeremy Grant. Daywan Coleman, also from JD, and on and on and on. Mike Benege, just you mm -hmm. in your time span of four years at Syracuse. When I look at the names and I think of the success and things that have happened with these guys, it almost seems like you were at Syracuse for like sixteen years because That's you were at like the end of, and the beginning of, and the middle of all these careers. Exactly, I think um, a lot of those guys got had had their moments. I think. Um, which tough, like even watching uh, Syracuse basketball now, it's like, um, obviously, it's like, I mean, if you're on a team that has like a, let's say less talent, right? It's a, it's going to be a struggle. So even like a Ty's battle, um, Elijah, he he actually did well his, his last year, but you want a team, it, you almost feel isolated. You feel like I'm sure if I was those guys, I feel like, man, I feel like you know, I feel like Johnny Flynn and. Uh, you know, Dante, uh, Dante Green, though, the, the time where he was averaging 39 and 40 minutes a game. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it sounds cool, but, you know, if you have to play that many minutes, it's something wrong. Something's wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I never played. I played one, one year over 30 minutes. I think went my sophomore year, I played like 29 minutes. All the other years, my senior year, probably yeah, somewhere 30 minutes. I mean, I probably maybe played one game in my whole career where I played 40 minutes. So, um, with that being said, is like you play with so many guys that's so talented that we all kind of had our moments. You know, the reason why you remember those names because you remember special moments where they did this or they did that, um, which is incredible. Um, I think now it's a little bit more tough because everything is put on two or three guys that's on the team. I think uh, – when I was playing, we were a lot more spread as far as scoring goal and talent goals. And the guys who were on the bench, they weren't playing because they couldn't play. <laughs> <laughs> they were playing because somebody was ahead of them, you know? So it's different. So I think, uh, you know, I was blessed to play with a lot of great players. And, you know, what's funny is you actually forgot Deion Waiters. That's one of the names you actually forgot. <laughs> oh, I thought I said the, that one, man. I, well, the group, yeah, I, I would have thought you would have said it first. Yeah, <laughs> you went because at first I thought you were you were naming the whole uh, the whole um, whole freshman year. So then yeah, you skipped over it. So even him, you know. So um, yeah, man, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. You know, sometimes I think like, man, you know, 
if I would have if I, I would have came at a down a down year, I would have averaged more points. But <laughs> 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 but I'll take I'll take the you know the the most starts and the most wins over you know potentially two thousand points. You know so you know two thousand points and what final fours and things like that. You know I'll take that over than you know barely making NCAA tournament. So I'm uh, you know I'm grateful, man, for my career, all the things, all the up and down basketball um, highlights and achievements, you know, I'm definitely grateful, grateful for my teammates and just, you know, just the whole experience at Syracuse and the fans, the fans are awesome support also being a hometown kid, you know, I thought, you know, for the most part, I represented myself pretty well. So, um, yeah. The surrealness you talk about scoring, like, you know, the potential of 2000 points, but he's got two more years if he wants it. He's already over yeah. a thousand. He was making threes like, like two more years because he'll be a, oh yeah because he got five years right yeah. So, what yeah, are your thoughts? I mean, how surreal is it about <laughs> Buddy that he was running around the dome as a kid when you were there, right? So yeah, yeah, he's uh, seventh, eighth grade. Yeah. So how sixth, do you? I mean, what was your relationship like with Buddy? Do you have a relationship with him now? And what do you think about his future at Syracuse? And, and is it surreal to you? Because when I picture Buddy, I picture sitting press row behind, in front of the bands behind the basket and yeah. seeing this little kid run by me and just kind of play around during the game. To be honest, if I was Buddy, I feel like on top of the earth. Um, just listen, I grew up in this dome and I'm able to, first of all, play here because most people didn't even think I could even make it here. And at this point, be the face of the team, you know? And obviously from the performance, you you know, it's not like, it's not just a, uh, I'm coach's son, you know, it's, I deserve to be here. So uh, for me, uh, just relationship, for, for one, it was a JD. Like, so I, like he started off from JD. So I, I, I believe he looked up to me because he was watching me in high school. You know, he, he grew up going to JD. So he's watching me in high school and watching me at Syracuse. So I think there's always a connection of that. And just watching him play at the same high school, I always followed him, you know, and I, I knew he was good. I think what year? I, I knew he was good, I think, either his freshman year, sophomore year. I be, that's when I knew. I was like, oh, this this is a this is a Division One player. That's when I knew, you know. So for me, it's just it's always love when I see him, you know, it's uh, a mutual respect. Um, even do like during COVID and things like that, I always had uh, – well, I text him mostly because uh, he was letting me into the gym. <laughs> they, they, you know, the Bayhams have a gym. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I actually didn't see him most of the time, but I was texting him to make sure he leave the door open because I was, you know, going in and getting shots. But, uh, you know, man, he's a wonderful kid out there. I think he deserved it, man. He works hard. Like, I always see him lifting weights, getting stronger. Like, you know, and guys who work hard, you know, I mean, I just wish the best for them. You know, because they, they, uh, they're willing to work. They're workers. You know, if you're willing to work for things, then um, for a lot of times, I hope it, it happened for you because you deserve it. Now, coming from Brandon Trish, uh, closing here, Brandon, you get asked the questions all the time, and you're probably not used to flipping the script. You get to flip the script on my show for something I've done called Rapid Fire for years. It allows the interviewee to be the interviewer. So it's the Brandon Trish takeover of Wake Up Call for three questions. They can be with basketball, sports, or they could be about okay. anything, but fire away. Who do you think is the most important Syracuse player in history? In history? Mm -hmm. The most important Syracuse player in history. Wow. Like the, the player who, like, when you think of Syracuse, I think of this guy. Like he he drove it. He drove Syracuse. Like you have certain programs where you just think of one guy, or it maybe when when there's so many guys, it's hard to pick that one guy. But yeah, I mean, I would say the national championship in 2003. There's so many players on that team: Josh Pace, Akeem Morick, Jerry McNamara, so on and so forth. And but I would say some people would say Carmelo because of what he did, because mm -hmm. they won a championship. But he wasn't right. the only guy in that run. 
I would say Pearl definitely mm-hmm. yeah. did something for the world of Syracuse. And for me as a kid at 10 years old, and you see the sign in my studio, Cuse is in the house, oh my God. Yeah. The man that I think made people believe that Syracuse could win a national championship was John Wallace. John so, Wallace? So I give John Wallace some credit. I know Billy Owens, Derek Coleman, but I think yeah. if it's like feel good, I think you probably have – you probably have to go with Pearl. I think some people would say Carmelo. If I had to put the poll out there right now, I think Pearl would be pretty high. I think the see the Pearl. So Pearl and um, am I like for obviously I, I know about Pearl, so it's not it's not the same. But for most people, when you think of Syracuse basketball, you you put Carmelo because for one, he dominant. He he has been the most successful pro. Yeah. And Syracuse history. Right, that's safe to say. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Pretty safe. So, uh, I mean, Derek Coleman, so Billy Owens had long careers, but Carmelo's still yeah, relevant. Yeah, he has, he right has now. like a, a dominance. He was that guy. So when you think, and he only spent one year at Syracuse. See, the other guys spent, you know, three and four years at Syracuse, right? So when, so when like a person who is, uh, let's say, thirty-five years old and under, you're gonna say Carmelo, for sure. If you're a little older, you're gonna say Pearl. And then second, maybe Derek Coleman. Yeah, I think that's fair. All right. Uh, next question. Um, actually, it's a two-part question. Okay. Um, first of all, who do Syracuse play next? <laughs> <laughs> West Virginia. Okay, West Virginia, right? So – I seen West Virginia play once. Actually, I don't know why I watched them multiple times, but I watched them play multiple times this year. Okay. What do you think is the? What would be the? Actually, all right. I'm actually. I, got, I know my next question too. Okay. What do you think is going to be like? How do you think? How 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 would they be able to beat those guys? What do you think they have to do to beat those guys? I think the zone has to be vibrant. I think you know playing in the zone that it means nothing, especially at the top of it if you don't put your hands out to the sides and put your hands up and you don't move quickly. So uh, I saw that West Virginia was able to, they're good at attacking the basket with hands in their faces. They're good at getting after it in traffic. Syracuse is going to have to collapse better. I think uh, the better that Jesse plays, as I've said, allows Marek to play back in a position or some type of a forward position so right. I think Jesse's got to be on. I think kadari has got to get those steals. Syracuse has been good at stealing the ball away. They didn't have a single steal in their 16-point victory over San Diego State, which was very interesting. But mm. So I would say the zone has to be able to collapse inside. They're going to have to get hands and faces. Uh, Buddy can still take – he can still take advantage of height matchup. They're going to have to figure out how to condense McBride's ability to score. He had 30 and 34 – 30 and 36 minutes, so very close to Buddy. Uh, McBride can go inside, outside. He took over the game when they needed him to. But even Culver, Culver. Is Culver still playing with West Virginia? Yeah, four out of five starters, including Culver, is, you know, scoring. Uh, they scored in yeah, double so figures. He, in the I, know, I believe he's their best player, actually. So I think Syracuse is going to have to learn how to help in that 2-3, shift quickly, get steals, take advantage of it, uh, be smart about the shots they take. And I've said this all season long, this team has not been all on once. So we've never seen a game where Alan Griffin, Quincy Garrier, Marek Dolezal, Buddy Beheim, Joe Girard, that everybody has been scoring the ball. If that happens, then this thing could really blow up into something incredible, 90 something points. So I think, you know, we need to see more of that. Robert Braswell is doing fantastic off the bench yeah, yeah, yeah. so there's a lot of good i think sarah i got them winning this game i believe they can uh, i run and create in a crazy way which i didn't know until i really uh, looked it up uh, jim Beheim is one in five against bob huggins with bob as the head coach of west west virginia well so, we beat them uh-uh when when we so, beat them uh every year i was there they never beat us so we go back and we look at it bob huggins hold on i'll pull it up again bob huggins we, we beat them because i remember by he 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 go tend the shot. We beat them home. We beat them their our, our freshman year. Cause I I only had good games. I have only had good games with West versus uh, West Virginia. Okay. So I, would you I say you remember. only had good games against West Virginia? Yeah, like 
against West Virginia, is the, I'll be in a slump. If I'm in a slump and I play West Virginia, 16, 20 points. All right. So I'm looking it up right now because I thought it was weird too to look at the numbers of it. To maybe see in it. a play, maybe in a tournament. So in the tournament, you were saying? Let's see here. Yeah, so because he, Bayhan been in the tournament 34 years. All right. So men's basketball. So they have 30. Okay. I don't know why it said 28 and 16. So Syracuse has 32 wins to 16 losses against West Virginia. And yeah, none of this was correct. Oh, I know what I did. I was looking at it through West Virginia's perspective. I apologize for my last video. Syracuse has won the last five against West Virginia. I looked at it opposite ways. I thought I was looking at Syracuse's history. I was looking at West Virginia's. So Syracuse has won. Syracuse is actually, wow. So I need to make a massive apology on the last one. So (laughs) six wins in a row. Then they lost one in 2007, eight, and then they won five. So Bayheim is five and one against Bob Huggins. So, okay. Yeah. I made a flip flop. I made, I made a, uh, a very interesting mistake there because I was looking at West Virginia's history and not Syracuse's. So Bayheim does have a, but yeah, I was like, this doesn't feel right to me that he's like, it would said something like seven and 22. That's Bob Huggins. Bob Huggins is seven and 22 again. So, well, no, Jim Bayheim seven and 22 against West Virginia. He's five and one against Bob Huggins. Okay. So now okay, I did yeah. it right. So my yeah, apologies was, on my last video. I was like, I was like, no, 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 no. Yeah. I was like, wait. I said, I know for sure. And I was like, maybe, maybe it's quite possible that Syracuse, but, but Syracuse haven't really played um, West Virginia since the Big East, you know? So. Yeah. That's a big gaffe on my part. Oh. Yeah. So they. And uh, the last yeah. part question is, uh, the last question is how good, do you think Kadari uh, Richmond in Richmond, right? Yep. Is that same? How good do you think he can be? And uh, uh, what do you think he can um, directly improve on? I think Kadari can be a guy who could have, you know, seven assists and double digit points in a game. I think that he wherewithal wise intelligence vision and his and his kind of his wingspan and whatnot I think he could be one of the best guards on the top of the zone in a while so I think there's a lot of upside for Kadari I think we've barely seen what he can do I like that he attacks the basket I like that he gets the shot up so if he's going to the basket he's going to get the ball to go up toward the basket and he's going to take an attempt he's not just going to get hit he has the intelligence and the basketball IQ overall that when that shot clock's running down and the ball's in his hands, that he'll look to who's near him, he'll bump the guy, and he'll get the shot up so he at least goes to the charity stripe. So I respect that. And so I think he's smarter than than you would expect uh, a true freshman to come in as. He's a a guy coming from, you know, the islands uh, of, you know, of New York, and I think that his intelligence is definitely there. I think his grit is there. I think New York basketball is just different. So he has all that going for him. What he can be is a point guard that we might remember forever. And I think he's mm-hmm. got a lot of upside and a lot of ways to go. But I think Kadari Richmond could be something truly special on this team. And I'm happy to see a guy like him be right at the beginning of his career because he, he's got an entire career ahead of him. And I think that he is going to be one of the players Syracuse fans are going to love to watch. Yeah, I agree with all that. I think. Um... When I look at him, I just look at – I think the first thing he can improve is just his energy as a as a basketball player, like his energy. If you ever watch him, he just look like – like he take his time. Yeah. He, he walks the ball up the court 100% of the time. Uh, if he, When he's in his own, he don't really move until he busts, until he busts still the ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's not overly active. <laughs> like, like the only time when I seen him block the shot, I was like, okay, why not try to do that more often? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think one, if he just pick his energy up, then he's going to be able to be in positions to do better more often. You know, like, okay. It's, it's a difference between being, um, cause a lot of times when we think of basketball IQ and being smart, we think of a person who's patient. Yeah, but you should be able to be energized and have energy, but still make the game 
uh, slower for you. You don't have to play slow for the game to be slower for you, if that makes sense. So yeah. I think that's the most important thing is just to him to keep the game slower mentally in his head, but to speed up everything that he does, um, you know, and not only when he's going to, going to attack. So if he's cutting through, cut a little faster. If he's bringing the ball up and he see, even if he doesn't, you know, uh, see an open and just sprint down, sprint to the uh, free, uh, uh, three point line and see if he can get two guys to come to him and then now make a pass to someone else. So I think energy is one, but other than that, man, like you said, man, I see I see some good uh, attributes. Great athlete, six five, six six. Um, he can handle the ball, you know. Once his, you know, I think once he figured that out, his jump shot and everything else, he worry about that later. Yeah, no, there's a lot of good coming from him, and a lot of great coming from Brandon Trish. Brandon joining us from Dubai. Brandon is always, I appreciate it. I, you know, I'm going to live through you. You've been all, you've been all <laughs> these places I want to go to. So man, just take yeah. those pictures. You've been, to, you've been to wh- how many countries have you been at this point? Uh, well, UAE, Dubai, uh, Turkey, uh, Italy, Greece, Israel has been, uh, so five countries, I believe. All right. So poor you living that life. So <laughs> make that money, have that fun, tour the world, take pictures, and I will uh, live vicariously through you. But as always, when it comes to career games started and games won and everything that happened in four years, Brandon Trish definitely going down in Syracuse history as one of our best. So I appreciate you as always. I, I love building on our friendship and, and that you take the time to uh, come on to the show. So more than anything else, I respect the person, Brandon Trish, and I hope nothing but the best for you. And I hope you continue to have longevity in your career and stay safe. And hopefully you and I will be able to be in the same room sometime soon and catch up there. Yeah, of course. You know, thanks for having me. Uh, anytime you text, you know, I'm, I'm always going to answer. And uh, anytime we could do a voice, a voice call or anything like that, you know, I'm always down to do that. Just, just, just all about setting up the time. So um, of course, you know, I, I love speaking about uh, the history of basketball, Q's basketball and just being a, a Q supporter now. Um, you know, I, I had a great time talking to you. So, uh, just, same, same to you, uh, be safe, you know, hopefully the COVID, uh, disappear, you know, sometime soon. Yeah, definitely hoping for that. So take care of yourself, Brandon, and I'll talk with you soon. All right. All right. Thanks.